about this information uh, and, and on the climate risks and helping us tackle food security. Over to you, Chilezi. Thank you so much, moderator. Uh, picking up from the discussion, what I need to underscore is that uh, long-term changes in climate will directly or indirectly affect many aspects of a society in a very disruptive manner and the ways which we have not seen. So in practical terms, given that the majority of African agriculture is rent-fed, climate change is going to number one, disrupt food availability. And number two is going to reduce access to food, both urban and rural areas, and is going to affect food quality also. And we know that we all then been advocating for a healthy diet. Coming now to agriculture, agriculture contributes to about 5% GDP for the Southern Africa economy. That is just to underscore the importance of the agriculture sector. And in terms of employment, it provides 70 to 80% of total labor force within the SADC region, and this is significant. However, the projected increases in temperature, changes in precipitation patterns, changes in weather, extremes, events, reduction in water availability, this will all going to affect agriculture production and productivity. And let me bring some sad statistics to contextualize what I'm talking about. Within Sadeg region, we have got estimated 27.4 million people who are food and nutrition insecure. Bring it home here in South Africa, we have got over 21% of South Africans who are food insecure. And as we speak, 22.1 million of South African households are experiencing hunger each day, and that is 12% of the total households. So those are scary statistics, but sometimes we need to mention them to bring the, the, the narrative about we need to change and move from rhetoric. The issue that I want to underscore before I go to my two eyes, which I have been asked to talk about, is that um, agriculture, as I've said, is a source of employment and economic growth. And there's no single sector which can do it alone. So we really need to work in transdisciplinary manner, multisectoral approaches being deployed. And therefore, as a fun up and we see the work that uh, GMI is doing, focusing on surface and groundwater is very important because they cannot deal with the problems of food insecurity alone and we cannot with the absence of availability of water. So for me, what I want to underscore is that innovative partnerships to finding solutions and taking actions are critical at this point. I need to mention that the journey to achieving the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals is very near. We are left with only seven years or under to get to 2030. So we need action. Coming now to my two eyes after providing that preamble, I'm going to talk about information and innovation. First, let me unpack why we need information. So the starting point of information is, is data. And we need access to data so that we can translate that into information. And for me, that is a game changer for, for sustainable uh, water management, for sustainable food production. What we know is that uh, organizations like ourselves and SADEC, GMI, we have been in the research space for the longest time. And we normally treat data as an end in itself. We don't go and walk the last mile of translating that data into usable form. And as such, normally then we don't inform practice and policy. So in terms of the context which, is, which we're talking about here, we need to make sure that we are mapping the hotspots where water is available or not available. We also need to know ways in which we can replenish or recharge our groundwater. Where do we get that data from? We need to find ways of preserving groundwater through sustainable use. And most important, which we normally ignore, how then do we make sure that we are not polluting this water? So we really need to find data around those issues. 
Coming now to the second issue of innovation. Through our research at Fanapan, we have been implementing a project called Transforming Irrigation Systems in Southern Africa. And we have identified two things as lessons that we have learned that we can upscale them. The first one is that technical fixes alone will not work as irrigation system and water use is a complex issue. And therefore we really need to find innovation platforms where we stimulate dialogue to lessen the conflicts around the use of water. So innovation platforms are a critical component in terms of engaging all the road players and making sure that those that we are supposed to serve are also inputting into the solutions that we are providing. The second issue which we've learned is around the technology, that we need to put technology into the hands of the farmers. And I will give two examples. So through the project that I've spoken about, the project provided opportunity to the farmers to access the full step technology and the chameleon technology. What do these two technologies do? They are handheld soil, moisture and water detectors that on the farm, a farmer can then test the soil moisture and also test the, 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 the nutrient value then within the, the soil to take a decision on one, when to irrigate and how much to irrigate. And two, where to fertilize and how much to fertilize. And that in a simple term, it makes sure that we are putting more money into the pockets of the farmers. That said, my take home message around these two eyes is that we need inf information and inversion so that we are water wise. This should consider both the supply side of water and the demand side of water. And further, information should be context specific and location specific. How then do we make sure that we have got technologies that are providing us with that context specific information? So for me, coming to conclusion, which is talking now to the theme which we are attending to, seat of change. There are pockets of successful innovations that have been implemented. However, majority of those, they've been at a pilot and micro scale. How then do we move from pilot to full implementation to realize wider and deeper impact? For me, there are three things to do. The first one, we need to scale up. And by scaling up, we mean that the research evidence that we generated now need to talk to policy influencing and decisions at that space. And also to make sure that we are, we are implementing laws that are supportive to what we are doing. Number two, we need to scale out. By scaling out, we need to replicate those successful innovations to different communities and different ge geographies for more people to benefit from what we've learned. And number three, as last, we need to scale deep. By scaling deep, I mean that where we've implemented as pilots, we need to make sure that post the project life, those communities are still benefiting from those interventions. I will leave it there for now. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You really did do justice to a few eyes there, Jalitzi. Uh, information and innovation, and you also brought up the very important issue of implementation, and we're going to get there, and how to go about meaningful implementation in terms of the scaling up, scaling out, and scaling deep sustainability. Excellent contributions. Thank you so much. I think I'm uh, going to pause there. Uh, we'll join um, our other panelists there. I think there are four more that we're still going to uh, engage with. But let's hear from the audience. We'll come back and continue on the research uh, and innovation side of things. Uh, we have a speaker from Water Research Commission, uh, and we will continue with, with uh, Dr. Shafiq Adams after I've engaged a little bit with the audience. Um, and we can hear more from Shafiq. But first, let's hear who would like uh, to say something. So I understand that Doris Mavuso uh, is on, on the line. Uh, Doris, do you have a contribution to make or a burning question for one of the panelists? Doris Mavuso, has, she, has Doris got rights for visibility? And 
Okay. Do we see Doris? Just disappeared. Just disappeared. Okay. So we also have uh, Paul Ole Latura. Paul, are you there? You have your hand up. You're interested to say something. Paul, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Paul. And I see Doris is back. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Doris can talk as well. Okay. Paul, you have the floor. Yes, 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 yes. I can. I can now. Yeah. Oh. Please proceed. Okay, Paul, we're having some trouble with your sound. We're going to move to Doris. Doris Mabuso, you had your hand up earlier. Doris, did you have a question? Okay, I just wanted to check. Is Doris not hearing us? Or you no longer have a question, Doris? Mabuso. Okay. The name? Mabotle. Mabotle? Mabotle. You have your hand up. Please feel free and make your contribution. Hello? Yes, Mabotle. Hello? Okay, I'm Mabota Mapika from Lesotho. Yes. And I uh, got interested when um, the, some, uh, the meteorolo meteorological studies talked about the part of El Nino. And I wanted to add on an addition to that, that a contribution, I mean, that uh, in as much as we are going to have, we should be aware that in as much as we are going to have El Nino, we experience El Nino, the child. Uh, most probably, not even most probably, uh, most of the people will have to um, with poor water from underground. And probably from the last two years, because there was still rain, there was still going to be much of water that they were with poor. But we are going to be on crisis. We people who are uh, dependent on corn water, maybe say a year or two years after the drought. So it might be um that we should be prepared not saying just now but maybe uh, in a year's time after many withdrawals have been done during the earning uh, uh, it would be a burden uh, on the crown report thank you thank you very much for your 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 contribution uh Mabote. very good um okay do we have any other contributions I don't see any hands here. Um, I will keep a look out for the hands. I'll ask my team to keep checking if there are any hands that go up for further contributions, but really appreciate that. And sorry, it didn't work out uh, with the others. So let's come back to the panel then. Um, Shafiq, the Water Research Commission um, has commissioned in incredible uh, research for, for many, many years. You yourself are, have a particular interest in groundwater. Um, and I know that Water Research Commission also really pushes the innovation agenda. Now, I know you have some, some concerns also about uh, innovation and, and implementation. Please share with us, and I'm also very keen, because you're from Water Research Commission, I'm also keen to hear what you are saying as Water Research Commission about the investments and how do we invest and who do we, in, who is supposed to invest? And I know South Africa has an interesting model to share, but Shafiq, innovation and implementation. Hey, thank you. I've got a few slides, so you okay. know, some share. Go um, ahead. And I hope it will play. Um, just tell me if you can see it. Yes. Okay. 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 
Yeah. So, so, so if, if you, and, and I'm going to scare you first. Um, and this is all work done by the, by, by, by the, by the Water Research Commission. Uh, and uh, the first I, um, and I'm breaking a bit of protocol, is that we are in trouble. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because if, if we see, as we march towards the end of, of this century, that 90% of Southern Africa will experience drought with significant variability and extreme event. And I think we've heard this um, already. Um, so if you just look at the, 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 the graph, you can see how it gets dry over time, but you can also note the noise. So the noise are indicating um, the, these wet and, and, and dry cycles. And we know from, um, from experience now, from lived experience, um, that when we grew up, uh, we had a season of rainfall. But nowadays, it seems like we have two days of seasonal rainfall. So most of the rain arrives in, in, in one or two days um, and which, which create uh, significant dis dis disruption. So what we do in terms of, of the research, um, and then I'll show you, and, and of course you're gonna be a bit skeptical and people spoke around um, the, some of the other drivers around climate change, population growth, and then uses um, as, an, as an example. So, you, you might be skeptical and you say, but hang on, that's just a model, it might be wrong, but hang on. So if we step back and if we take from the, from the current and we walk back to the 1950s, you can clearly see the shift from a wetter period that's kind of blue um, to a more brownish color that, um, that indicates that we've been getting drier. So the WRC was established after the droughts of, of the late 60s. So we established in 1971. Um, and, we, and our job since then is to make uh, the country resilient and then to, and, and to be adaptable. So climate change, we have been in this game for 50 years already. And it is not something that's gonna come. It is already uh, something that, uh, that we've been fairly, and I think successfully managed uh, through it as a country. Um, so, and again, um, so, so what, we, what we also see is that, that the, 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 the seasons usually were deaf, and most of our storage is designed in a way that we can um, do a two seasons of below rainfall, but not three. In Cape Town is probably the best example. So after three uh, dry seasons in, in Cape Town, you had, they were in trouble. So we don't have the storage, but they were also in trouble because they have not diversified early enough. And they got this warning way in advance, decades in, in advance, that they need to look at their water security in, 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 in a different way. And of course, they are now probably ahead of most of the, of the provinces and the district municipalities in developing groundwater as part of their supply mix. So we know that by 2030, we have, we're going to have a, a significant demand and um, the uh, do nothing um, numbers, um, again, aggregated to a national scale, indicate there will be a 17% deficit. Um, and if you look on the right hand side, how vulnerable we are, and all this is all WRC research, how vulnerable we are, that 50% of our water comes from 10% of the land. So just think about if uh, you have pollution, if you have um, uh, uh, drier areas, not getting enough rainfall in, in, into these areas. So the blue is, is our water towers for, 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 for surface water and the green is our groundwater, uh, mainly our, our groundwater systems. And if, if you look around and if you can see around Mafi Keng um, to, 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 to Cal, uh, we also have a lot of uh, dolomitic um, uh, aquifers, most some of our more productive things. So what we want to do at the WRC and what we've been doing for the last 50 years is to find I solutions. So how do we do these things? But as we see that as the pace of, of these uh, changes happen at a, a fairly quick pace, we need now to shorten that, 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 that um, time from research or innovation to uptake and implementation. And I'll, talk about it uh, later. 
Um, so what, what, how we see it, and, and I think James mentioned it, a few other, and I think Ruth, you includes, included um, in, in the discussion, so it makes this slice easier, but it, it, it puts into a visual way what we've all been saying, that we need to coordinate, we need to integrate for transformational change. If you do individual projects, you only get outputs um, and, 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 and your implementation impact is generally low, we know that. But if you have some sort of programmatic integration over many years, dealing with a, a specific um, issue, like for example, uh, manage aquifer recharge, um, which to me is one of the, the key things that, 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 that we're driving in South Africa. Um, Yazid is in, I think he's in the thing. So, so he manages a lot, some of this at, at the WRC. But if you look at Africa as a whole, we can only readily identify 54 um, managed aquifer recharge schemes, 11 of them sits in South Africa that's at some form of, of, of implementation uh, beyond the, the, the piloting. But they're fairly small in scale. But again, um, I think the first um, artificial recharge scheme in South Africa is from 1979, and that's the Atlantis scheme. So what we want to do in terms of the research, the information, and, and, and I think it's also important to note that uh, we can talk about data a lot, and I'll show, show a slide later on. We can talk about data a lot, but I think Ruth, uh, facilitator, and the team, I think information is right. We can collect a lot of data, but if we don't convert it into information and knowledge and intelligence, uh, we're just going to have a lot of data. And I think right. this is the some of the issues. And what we're also saying that, and again, I'll show some of these, the examples that we're doing in terms of how do you engage more stakeholders for this transformational change where you create jobs, you get food security. It's not about individual projects. It's not maybe about uh, a programmatic integration over time, but it's about how do we connect and coordinate. And we spoke around the nexus so the WEF Nexus is, a, is, is, is one of our flagship programs at the Water Research Commission. So driven by my colleague, uh, Sylvester Pandeli, most of you will know of him. Uh, he's also, I think, Vice President of ICED. Um, but again, to get this uh, impact, we need plurality of stakeholders and not just so different. I think that the, the new buzzword in South Africa is trans, multi, and whatever disciplinarity. But what we are talking here about is how do you involve communities in a meaningful way? And I'll show you some of the examples. But also using, not go and study them, but how do you use them? Um, some of the work that, that, that we've done when speaking around the information uh, component is that um, we, we use communities in a way that uh, we do, um, and we've shown, I think it improves model performance by something like 33%. I can't remember the, the exact uh, number. If you do participatory modeling, so you take the numerical modeler wherever he sits and you engage the people living in the catchment or in the area and say, okay, but what's your experiences? How do you see it? And then you start saying, okay, but my conceptual model says, uh, this spring runs for the whole year, but they'll tell you, you know, it's only six, six months of the year and this is the thing. So you can um, um, improve your model, et cetera. So this is what, what, what we talk about. Uh, involving stakeholders um, at, 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 at a meaningful level. Uh, so, and again, uh, I think some of these examples have been, been, been spoken uh, around what we need to do, but we're already doing it. So we have different programs at, at the WRC about how they, do we uh, diversify our countries, water supplies, how do we use multiple use services and local adaptation of, of, um, of, of local resources again, bringing a, a integrate and coordinate and augment. Uh, citizen science is one of the, uh, another flagship program that we've, and we haven't called it citizen science, but we've been in this also for decades um, to improve water stewardship and data for decision-making. Um, and so we have a lot of products, in, especially around groundwater guidelines, tools, and know-how. Um, so all these programs while we create, so we are outcomes-based organization, uh, we count the outputs, how many students, how many reports, but we also um, look at some of the, uh, the, the, the other outcomes around adaptation 
resilience, job creation, uh, food and water security, um, et cetera. And again, uh, that's just so um, people will recognize the ladies there, they from, from Chakuma. Um, so we, we intervene in a, in a self supply scheme. Instead of us going there as, as technical experts and, and engaging people and say, okay, but we know how you should do it. We listen to them and we optimized what they did in terms of the indigenous knowledge. So we took the indigenous knowledge and we put our engineering as a plus. And of yeah. course, that improved the, the system considerably. Uh, whereas in most other cases, you kind of, we will tell you and we will provide for you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is it. Um, talking about the, the investment side, uh, um, uh, is, 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 is the problem for us. And then more so for us that, that, that manage research in the resources side. So my colleagues that's developing the next generation toilets, they've got Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation money, et cetera. They have something tangible. They can say, okay, but look at this nice toilet. We, you don't have to use water. Look at this nice toilet. Instead of using 13 liters to flush a, 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 a toilet, you can only use two now. Something that so people can look at, touch, feel, and go in awe. But if you say, yeah, look at that field, we want to do artificial recharge. It's much more difficult to get that investment. But what we are doing, in, um, and then we're part of the consortium, and it's a Jeff funded project around the um, ecological infrastructure. But how do we get people to start funding in, in, into, into some of these things? So from, from, from the value of that perspective, we, we still there for especially for, for the newer in, innovations, but also the employed stuff that we need to implement. So we put a lot of things into the RDI in terms of resources, time over many years, but when you have the product, there's no, no one that you can uh, sell it to because, you know, in South Africa, it's a public good. It's a, it's a, but again, part of the models that being spoken about in South Africa is the triple P model. So it's now a few years and it's back on the table. And I think there's um, even um, uh, in terms of adjusting some of our strategies, our policies, et cetera, to enable this. But I think for groundwater, we still a way off because even on the ecological infrastructure, although I, I, I'm um, the, the group that manages the program sits within my group, um, I'm still uh, struggling to convince them that an, that an aquifer is also uh, ecological infrastructure. So they're still busy with their riparian and, and, and those type of things. So what we see that a lot of companies want things to be de-risk, there, there needs to be market uh, acceptance and it needs to be scalable before they start investing in in the commercialization and right. implementation so, so let me, uh, let me just let me that, I'm yeah okay all right yeah i'm done thank you so much uh, uh Shafiq. you know you mentioned some some really critically important uh things there data to information information update um, making sure that we invest in generating that information and moving it from information and research information into the implementation arena. And even more, you said investment for co commercialization. So fantastic inputs from you. Thank you very much, uh, Shafiq. And I'm going to try and reach now um, the other um, panelists um, because you spoke now uh, about uh, ecological infrastructure. But before we get to ecological infrastructure, I'm going to first go to CEO Cobwa, Trevor Shongwe. You are the CEO of a water authority, the Kamati Basin Water Authority. And uh, you are very much um, focused on developing infrastructure. And I think many of the panelists today have spoken about how vulnerable that we are uh, to climate change and the impacts because we don't have adequate infrastructure. So Trevor, please tell us what COBWA, uh, what COBWA does and why, why we need to invest in, in this built infrastructure. And uh, then Shafiq also spoke about ecological infrastructure, but I'm going to come to our Jeff colleague uh, in the little time that we have available. But, Trevor, please share with us 
um, your key comments uh, on why we need to invest in infrastructure and integrated infrastructure at that. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Ruth, and uh, I'd like to greet everyone in the section. Uh, we are actually the Komati Basin Water Authority. Uh, it's an institution that is uh, established by two countries, uh, that is the Republic of South Africa and the Kingdom of Eswatini, basically to look at uh, the sharing of waters uh, between the two countries. So this has come in the form of two dams, uh, one dam is sitting in the Republic of South Africa, <laughs> being three copies on uh, the left of the screen, or yeah, the right of the screen, and then the other one is Makuka, uh, which is on the uh, South Africa on the Swazi side. Right. These two countries actually have uh, invested in infrastructure, as indicated, and uh, there was issues of trust there. They actually were able to trust each other that uh, today they're sitting with infrastructure, which is actually at about 4.5. A billion rands and managed through an institution, uh, the institution which we are actually sitting in, OBWA, and this institution is jointly managing uh, the system as, uh, as a unit. Uh, otherwise, the two dams always run as a system where water is released from either of the two to make sure that the demands downstream are always uh, fulfilled. Uh, I'm trying to actually share here uh, but my slideshow is not moving, but I'll continue uh, to indicate that uh, uh, we uh, actually have invested in this infrastructure in an integrated manner, such that uh, when you look at the two dams, they are run as a system and they've captured the Nexus approach. Uh, there's been a lot of talk on the web Nexus wherein uh, there is uh, issues of water, which is the water that we share. Jointly, the two dams are giving us 583 million cubic meters. And then from that, we are able to actually uh, distribute the two or the water within the system uh, where we have one dam uh, at 251 million cubic meters, the three copies in South Africa and the Makuka Dam in the kingdom of Eswatini with uh, uh, around 332 million cubic meters. Currently, both dams are at 99% because we run them as a system. As we release the water, we train them at the same time, and then we also make sure that they peak at the same time. If you look at the graph that has been displayed uh, in the year 2016, 2015. Oh, we lost Trevor. Okay. Okay, I think we will, we have lost uh, Trevor, unfortunately, but I think he makes a strong case for um, investing in, in uh, infrastructure uh, to help us cope with uh, reducing uh, our vulnerability to climate change, both in terms of droughts and floods, water storage, the dams. And in fact, that Maguga Dam uh, scheme uh, is looking at water, energy, and food security. It's multi-purpose infrastructure. So uh, we don't know if Trevor will uh, manage Sorry. to... Are you there, Trevor? Sorry, Ruth. Sorry, yes, Ruth. Like, what, you. You see, we, yeah, with technology and networks, sometimes these things do happen. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, yeah, yes, we are... We, we are running the two dams as a system, as indicated, and we are making sure that we train them at the same time, and we also make sure that we replenish them at the same time. And uh, the Welfast Nexus is actually allowing us to also generate hydropower uh, from the dam. Right. Currently, we are generating power from one of the dams being Makuka Dam. And in three copies, as yet, we are not generating power from there at the moment. But going okay. forward, we believe that. Okay, I think, uh, but I, I luckily we did get to hear um, what Trevor was sharing with us. And I think the important aspects of an integrated approach to investments, dealing with multiple sectors 
Uh, and that is actually a more efficient way. But also what is important about what Trevor is saying is that in COBWA, we have investment in the infrastructure from the two member states, Eswat, the Kingdom of Eswatini and also South Africa. So a tremendous example there. But now, um, Astrid, I'm going to come to you now because we always talk about uh, investing in built infrastructure and it's, it's, it's what we speak about a lot in this region in Southern Africa and you know our region well. You're with the Global Environmental uh, Facility and you're supporting uh, many of the river basin uh, organizations in very uh, interesting and necessary work in ecosystems. And I know you're supporting also some very important work that SADC Groundwater Management Institute uh, is leading. But really, uh, Astrid, convince us. We've just heard about the need for infrastructure. So given where you are in Jeff, uh, what do you see the role of natural or ecological infrastructure for water security? And convince all of us that believe in hard infrastructure that we also need to invest in ecological infrastructure. Um, Astrid. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me here at the seminar. Um, so this is it's like very exciting. So many good points being made. I will try to convince you, but I don't have always all the data, which I also will talk about. But I'm very much convinced that in most cases, we cannot engineer ourselves out of problems and solutions. We need to work with nature and not ignore it. And that benefits both the infrastructure and, and nature and people at the same time. So let's take a few examples without getting too technical here. Let's take the example of storage, for example. You know, storage for multipurpose and all, uh, irrigation power yeah. or water for cities. The lifetimes of these reservoirs is limited if the watershed upstream is degraded, right? So we will get lots of sediment flows, we will have peaks of runoff and so forth. So if we invest in the same time in sustainable managed watersheds where the sediment flows are captured in the right way, and also, there's more infiltration of water. We replenish the water source and we have less of these peaks, which are getting worse and worse with climate. We will increase the life of the infrastructure. We will increase the livelihoods of people that actually farm and live in the watershed and we increase the biodiversity that's there. Or let's take another example, urban development. We had some data there on, uh, I think, which was from Trevor, maybe, or from Shafiq, you know, how many more people will live in cities? So we will have so much more demand for water and clean water and at all times from, from urban usages. So, okay, we can do water savings. We can fix pipes, which is huge. We have hugely leaping, leaking old pipe systems everywhere, not only in Southern Africa. I've come from Germany. We have like brick walls still in pipes in the old cities. Um, we can invest in agriculture and agriculture as a major user in the same watershed, you know, to make it more efficient. That's all very good, but with climate change, would it not also make sense to invest in rehabbing watersheds and to infiltrate <laughs> water underground? It is more resilient once we have underground water. It is cheaper to store there and it will be more equally available even in times of drought. So why not have recharge zones either in the watersheds or have recharge basins and any forms of managed aquifer recharge, which I'm sure Shafi can talk about all the elements yeah. that are in Southern Africa. Um, and maybe just let me add, add one example from maybe from my country where I come from. I'm German, I'm an environmental engineer. Germans love engineering, right? So when, when river transport was and still is the major issue on rivers, what did we do, you know? So, these messy meandering rivers and a lot of sediments on the ground, you know, it makes them straight and you put some walls so they're deep, all very nice and fine. And that makes shipping easier, faster and all of that. But then with climate change and more extremes coming, we saw much more, if it's on the Rhine, if it's on the Danube, if it's on the Elbe, enormous floods out of a sudden coming over those dikes into the cities and with lots and lots of costs. So what do we do now is realizing that maybe engineering alone and engineered investment isn't, isn't always the right solution. So now we're 
in many areas, breaking open these dikes and giving room to the river. You know, having space for the water to go to go in the floodplains. And what does it do? It's not only protecting downstream the cities and the people that are there, but it also infiltrates in these floodplains. So we have groundwater recharge. They make them also with all the sediments going in there, the, the soil more fertile, so you have better production and you have areas for agriculture. And you bring biodiversity back, which all helps to give yields of agriculture also up and livelihoods around. So that's my point is that enhancing and using natural infrastructure can bring multiple wins for livelihoods, nature and the infrastructure itself. And if you want to scale that, of course, there's upstream investments to be done, right? So that's the thing if you have to value what you get in these multiple benefits. It is being done though, by, by uh, and it's, it's usually successful. We see even private sector investing in it. So if you're a lot of yes. of bottlers, if you're a bottling industry, you need clean water in your bottle. And even if you put like some, you know, sweet fizz into it, that's your capital. So we see right. the arrangements of water funds and the GF quite often tries to help establish the ways on getting these water funds into place. So upstream, downstream payments to upstream communities to protect that water tower right. for greater infiltration, for not logging, for protecting it from contamination. So, right. but that, what does it need to, to scale that up? And so we come back to another two eyes there on information and on institutions. So a lot of times what we those see with this natural infrastructure being used becomes a bit anecdotal. We don't have good enough information and baselines that are being put into place. You know, let's rehab the watershed and it shall infiltrate and it shall capture sediments. But then there wasn't a good baseline that captured what it was coming from. There wasn't a good assessment sometimes of, if this part of the watershed where you're investing right by the infrastructure sometimes is really the area where most of the sediments come from. Is this right. still is good, but it's suboptimal yeah. if you want to have an impact. And then there's not enough measurement of the impact, you know, to really say bang for the buck, how much we invested and how much do we get out of it? So right. there will be more investment in it and capturing these co-benefits. So, it's nice to say it's good for the livelihoods of the people, but if you don't do a baseline on how much people earned before, how can you say yeah. they're really better off? And the same yeah. for nature, you say, okay, got to be biodiversity came back. But if you don't have a good measure at the beginning, you cannot argue that this was really success successful. So for scaling yeah. up these things and natural mm -hmm. infrastructure, you've got to capture the data before, after, and you've got to do some assessment in, initially. And to the institutions, well, these payment schemes need oversight. They need transfer of payments, right? And they need implementation of these efforts and compensation for non-use or different uses upstream. So you do need functioning institutions to do so mm -hmm. on local and on national level, and they need to be credible and they need to be inclusive. People need to trust it. So mm -hmm. institutions are being a very, very important background there for scale up. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you, you've mentioned some really critical eyes there and, and thank you for that. I'm, uh, we're running out of time, but I want to uh, really emphasize the point of the investment in information, which is absolutely critical because if we don't have the information, we can't do the implementation properly and we can't definitely can't measure the impact. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. And I'm sure Shafiq is very excited that you have uh, spoken about uh, aquifer storage. And uh, indeed, I would seriously support this as an ecological, an investment in ecological infrastructure. Why not? Uh, it doesn't have to be a dam uh, all the time, but fantastic uh, contributions from you. And I like the fact that you spoke about innovative, uh, fi sustainable financing, and, and we start bringing in these other types of financing mechanisms. But thank you, Astrid. Unfortunately, I have to stop it there because I just want to ask James uh, Sarawamba um, what he's picked up from, from the panel in terms of some of the key contributions. James, I hope you were very attentive uh, in listening and 
hearing. And I mean, I got excited listening to all these panelists. James, what did you pick up from the panelists? Some key messages for our audience as we wrap up. Thank, thank you, uh, Ruth. Um, let me say, I think this is a very difficult task because I actually have quite a number of pages of notes, but I also <laughs> note that uh, we only have a few minutes to go to wrap up as well. I will just pick some of the um, highlights that I picked from the contributions. Um, one of the points raised by, uh, by Carter is the issue of, um, I think, whether it's uh, uh, gr groundwater is used for adaptation or mitigation or and things like that. that then it brings up to the um, discussion that um, has been going on whether uh, groundwater is is actually um, an adaptation measure. Looking at our region as, as in Sadiq, where the usage of groundwater is still very, very much um, uh, low and the potential to exploit the resource is still quite massive. Then we have this other example of where it is actually uh, overused and it has caused, is causing havoc. We have learned a lesson there that whatever we do moving forward, we should do it with that type of caution that allows us to utilize this resource sustainably and not uh, have the un unintended consequences of over abstraction. I also picked um, a, a contribution from Asi uh, where he was talking of um, the impacts of climate change um, and how we should think about um, this as um, something that 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 um, we can actually exploit the opportunity. We have the floods that are coming up. We have the droughts. This cycle should teach us more on utilizing the opportunities when we have a lot to store the water and then utilize it when we have a, a lake. But of course, still bearing in mind that there are risks associated with either, as well as the early warning systems. I think the early warning systems that we should put in place as a, uh, as a region and as a people to be alerted to the upcoming uh, issues. Um, just a couple more. Uh, we have got too many pilots. I think that's something I picked. We, we need to think carefully. This is something that was raised by uh, Dr. Chilizzi. Too many pilots, we need to think about upscaling, um, replicating and scaling deep. Um, yeah, yeah I, I see I've run out of time, but I, I, want, I just wanted to also mention the issue of uh, diversification, something that was raised by Shafiq, uh, diversifying our uh, resource utilization, um, and also look at the programmatic approach, uh, not being isolated right. to uh, localities. And then the investments that Chef brought about, uh, which are very real. And finally, we had Astrid uh, weighing in on um, the natural um, infrastructure options and how we should not always think about the brick and mortar uh, approach to barricade the the, 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 the water from uh, getting to where it's naturally supposed to go and be used sustainably and support the other ecosystems that are around these uh, communities. So in a very quick um, snapshot, I would have gone on for a few hours, I'm sure, because we had a very rich um, contribution from the panelists and from everyone who contributed uh, thus far. With those remarks, let me get it back to you once more, unless you have a specific question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, um, James. And, and uh, yes, we are pushed for time, um, but uh, thank you so much. You picked up some key points there. And uh, let's just go quickly. Uh, um, Paul is on the line. Paul, would you like to make your contribution very briefly? We, we might get... Uh, cut off uh, because we, we've gone beyond uh, 16 hours. Uh, Paul, please share your contribution. Yeah, yeah I'm, 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 yes, I'm available. Good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very happy that I um, get being listening to all this speech from the panelists, from Thank the you. profession. So uh, as, a, as a, a young Maasai, Masai community with its rich cultural heritage and deep connection to the land has a long relied on groundwater sources for their mm -hmm. water need. 
So uh, to conclude on, uh, on what have been said, uh, more communities engagement and awareness are essential to promoting innovative groundwater, groundwater management practices. Yes. Educating our communities about the importance of water conservation, the risky of over pumping and the benefit of adapting sustainable approaches can foster a sense of ownership and responsibility among community members. Lastly, collaboration and partnership are key to driving innovation in groundwater management. Government agencies, NGOs, academic institutions, and private sector should work hand in hand to develop and implement sustainable water management strategies. By pooling resources, sharing expertise, uh, technology, we can create a comprehensive framework that addresses the specific needs and challenges faced by the Maasai community. You have made a fantastic contribution. Thank you, Paul. And I think you have done justice to the entire um, uh, webinar that we've had by highlighting some of those critical aspects that were actually, some of us mentioned a few of these in the beginning, the indigenous knowledge you, 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 you raising that, uh, we spoke about being inclusive, you're raising that and making those investments, uh, those critical investments. So thank you, Paul, for being patient. We couldn't connect earlier with you, but thank you for your contributions. Um, I, I think just to, to wrap up and, and bring this together, I think this panel and the, the, the contributions from the floor have done real justice uh, to the nine eyes. I'm sure we're sitting with more eyes now, but I think we have uh, learned about being inclusive and why it's important, why we need to follow integrated approaches and why we need to invest in innovations and information and institutions as well as infrastructure, both the built gray infrastructure that Trevor spoke of, as well as the uh, natural ecological infrastructure. I think we've also spoken about how interconnected we need to be. And I think the, the strong message of partnerships, Paul also mentioned it now uh, in the end, uh, and Astrid spoke about uh, innovative financing. She spoke about payment for ecosystem services. Let's get those sustainable innovative financing mechanisms uh, working uh, and let's have integrity also as we, we, we go about that. So uh, colleagues, I thank you most wholeheartedly for joining us. I think Jalitsi, if you're still on the call, it just remains my uh, honor and duty to say thank you to everybody for uh, allowing me to be moderator of this uh, very exciting panel. I'm most privileged to, to have done that. Chalitzi, I now say over to you uh, for, your, for your vote of thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, moderator. Noting that uh, we are beyond time allocated, let me just say that uh, we, from my side, where I'm sitting, we have deepened this discussion and we have unpacked what we mean and also what is required to be done so that we are water wise. And I believe after these two hours of deliberations, we are now water wise and we're going to do what I've suggested. I believe also that uh, this webinar we convened was inclusive and it was safe space to dialogue and to unpack these issues. And for that, I thank you for your moderation. However, there is one thing that I need to underscore that uh, we really need to start to catalyze a collective action. And we need to think through as different organizations, how do we start to build uh, inclusive partnership which are mutual beneficial to make sure that we don't leave no one behind, but we are propelling forward to make sure that we go to implement this. Coming now to the thank yous. So first, let me thank all the co-conveners of this webinar. We all know who we are, so I won't go through the list. Second, I will want to thank you again, your Ruth, for facilitating. And to all our esteemed panelists, they have uh, unpacked what they were asked to share with us, and I really appreciate their contribution. And, going beyond their call of duty to prepare to come and share with us. Yeah. Last but not least, which is very much important, are our participants. 
we really appreciate your time because we know that there are the competing events, but you chose to spend the last two hours with us. And for that, we are really indebted to yourself for spending time with us, for listening to us. And I saw that the chat box was buzzing and I believe that people have enjoyed and they've interacted. However, we apologize that we didn't have enough time to interact with ourselves, but it's a lesson learned next time we're going to do better. So thank you so much, colleagues. I believe that uh, this marks the end of our webinar. We really appreciate spending time with us. It was a fruitful engagement and we got to make sure that the deliberations are recorded and are shared further. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chalitzi. Applause <laughs> to everybody. Thank you. Is there a video? Thank you. No. Okay. Well, it's goodbye from our side. Thank you all and tremendous contributions. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. I can leave. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, now uh, we're going to end the meeting. I'm going to ask uh, Sisnozi to end the meeting and stop the recording. Thank you.